about going over the homework. Uh, these first ones should have been easy for you. Um, all we had to do was do a vertical line test on them. Draw the vertical line in. It crosses in two separate points. So that is no. It is not a function. If I grab that vertical line and draw, drag it over to part B, you'll see that it only crosses at one point each time. So that would be a function. 8A, not a function because it crosses at three points here. 8B, not a function because it crosses at two points. Number 23, it said graph the functions in exercises 23 through 26. Uh, we could have either done this by hand or through Desmos. Through Desmos, you just draw those intervals in. So if it's x, when x is between 0 and 1, then when x is 0, it's 0, and when x is 1, y is 1. And so we have a line with closed dots because it's going to be a uh, equal sign underneath. Then going from 2 minus x, so if I do 2 minus 1 at 1, it is going to be the same spot. And coming out to 2, it's going to get closer and closer to 0. So if you think about it, when I put 2 in, your uh, point is going to be 0, your y. So that's what our graph should have looked like for 23. Number 24, I had 1 minus x when it's between 0 and 1. So if I think about it, it's 0. 1 minus 0 is 1. And 1 minus 1 is 0. So I'm drawing a line going down like this. Then at 2 minus x at 1, that would be 2 minus 1, which would be 1 again. So it starts up here. We're going to have an open dot. And it's going to come right back down to zero with a closed dot. Number 25, we have 3 minus x when x is less than or equal to 1. I actually move this 1 out a little further because that's our only real point on this one. So when it's less than or equal to 1, it's 3 minus x. So at 0, it would be 3 minus 0. So that's 3. When it comes out to 1, it's at 2, because 3 minus 1 is 2. We have a straight line coming down to there. And then it's 2x when x is greater than 1. So if I think about it, 2... Um, 2 times 2 is 4, so it's going to be all the way up here. But to find my point where it intersects, I still plug a 1 in here, even though it's greater than 1. So 2 times 1 is 2, so it's an open dot here. Since this is already a 2 with the closed dot, we don't have to worry about drawing the open dot in. And then we draw a straight line going up, and this would just go on forever now. So you throw a little arrow on the end there. Everybody good with 23 through 25? If you're do, to do this on Desmos, uh, let's look at one of the problems. We'll just do 23. So doing it on Desmos, it's x and 2 minus x. So I'll just punch those in. x and 2 minus x. Now the way that I do it is now I just have to set up an interval and you would do when, and I don't remember what my values were, uh, 0 to 1 and 1 to 2. So you would just do 0 less than equal to x less than equal to 1. And then down here, you would just do your parentheses and 1 less than or equal to x. Uh, 
SN equal to 2. And so now I have just have the graph of that. And if I wanted to share this, like if you wanted to submit it to me, just this graph, you just click this and then copy the link. And you can either put it right in your homework assignment or you can just put it in the comments. All right, moving on to number 33. It says, for what values of x is the floor function of x equal to 0? So we're looking for any number going up to 1, because if it makes it all the way up to 1, then that is going to give us a floor function of the floor value would be 1. So it's going to have to be a number between 0 and 1, because it's the smallest integer less than or equal to the number. So x can be 0. If I plug the floor function in, 0 equals 0. That's a floor function, or that's an integer, so it stays right at that integer number of 0. Um, and then anything going up to 1, if I do 0.999, it's the greatest integer that's less than the number. So if I'm putting 0 0.999 in, the greatest integer that's less than that is 0 still. So it's any number between 0 and 1. I do need to make this not less than or equal to 1. It has to just be less than 1. Because if it was equal to 1, then our floor function... I did the same thing. Our floor function would be uh, 1 for that. So it's got to be less than 1. Now it says, what would the ceiling function be? That's where we're looking for the smallest integer that's bigger than the number, which means we're going to have to go into the negatives. So that would be x greater than negative 1 and less than or equal to 0. So if I have negative 0.5, that's going to go up to the next integer, which is going to be 0. All right, for number 34, what real number satisfy the equation where the floor function is equal to the ceiling function? And that's going to be only on integers. And that's because I'm, if I'm putting a floor function in of, say, 2, then 2 is my answer. If I put a ceiling function in on the same number, oops, put a ceiling function in on the same number, it's also going to be 2. Because it's the integer value. Number 35, does the ceiling function of negative x equal negative floor function of x for all real x. So let's just put some numbers in right away to see. If I say my x is 2, then the ceiling function, I'll make it 2.5 just so we get to that point. Then my ceiling function of negative 2.5 is equal to negative 2. Then my floor function for 2.5 is 2, and I have the negative in front of it, so that would also be negative 2. So it wants to know if this is true for all real, all real x. And I can try some other values in. I can go negative, so that my then my ceiling function of a negative negative 2.5 negative of a negative makes it a positive. That would become a 3. My floor function of negative 2.5 becomes negative 3, and it's a negative of that, so that would be a positive 3 as well.
Lastly, if I tried zero, that's going to be zero and zero. And then try something like 0.5, which is a number that's before one. Ceiling function of negative point of uh, negative 0.5 then is zero. And then I'm going to look at the floor function of 0.5, which is zero. And so that's going to work for all of them. So that's more of a kind of trickier question where you have to put a lot of thought into it and try all the different, a bunch of different possibilities. But it's always going to bring you back to where that, uh, the negative of the floor function is equal to the ceiling function with the negative inside. I would not ask you something like that on your test. All right, well, let's move on to 1.4, identifying functions in mathematical models. All right, linear functions. A function of the form y equals mx plus b, where m and b are constants, are called linear functions. Constant functions are just where m equals 0. So for this one, I would write linear functions y equals mx plus b. And then don't worry about anything else for that top part. And on the bottom, constant functions, you can write all of that, are just functions where m equals 0. When we look at power functions, a function where, where y equals x to the a, where a has to be a constant, is called a power function. So a is just going to be some number. It could be 2, 3, 4, 5. But traditionally, we think of power functions as being just that, being positive numbers. But there are some other cases to consider. We have a equals n, where a is a positive integer, and that's what we're used to. And so when it's a positive integer, it's going to look like this. When it's y equals x, it's a straight line y equals x squared creates a parabola. y equals x to the third kind of comes up, crosses 0, and goes back up again. y equals x to the fourth looks more like a cup than a parabola. Still the same shape. Starts up high, comes down to 0, goes back up high. You'll notice that anytime I have an even integer as my exponent, like x to the fourth, it's going to follow this same pattern. The only difference is this bottom is going to get a little wider each time. y equals x to the fifth looks a lot like y equals x to the third, but kind of keeping with the same concept. I have a odd integer as my exponent, so when that's an odd number up there, you're going to notice that it is always going to have this same pattern where it goes from uh, negatives up to zero, and then back up again. If I look at x to the third, it's a little slimmer. x to the fifth gets a little wider in here. But this is how your graphs are always going to look whenever it's a positive integer. When a is equal to negative 1 or negative 2, that means it's going to turn this into a fraction. So remember, when you have an exponent as a negative, uh, it makes it go down into the denominator. And so this is what it would look like. 
for x or for a equals negative one it's going to be this where it's starting up close to the x-axis from negative infinity coming down as it gets close as x gets closer to zero your graph or your y goes to negative infinity coming on the right side of the uh, y-axis it's going to drop down so it's going from infinity when x is close to zero dropping down to zero as x approaches infinity if you look at uh, y equals one over x squared remember we can't ever have a negative so basically whenever i'm looking at a positive uh, even integer in my denominator what that does is it's going to take this part that's down here and flips it up to the top because I can't have a negative. And you'll notice that this one is much skinnier, and that's because it's to the second power. As we continue to proceed with this, if I went to like 1 over x to the 8th, this is going to get even closer and come up like that much faster. So that's basically what you're looking at for those ones. And that's where we will pick up tomorrow, just starting from that point in our notes.